Hey, beautiful friends. Welcome back to Pain to Passion Live. I'm so excited because I get to talk with my new friend, Morgan, today, who I met on Instagram. I don't even know how we connected on Instagram. I don't remember. I reached out to you. You had posted something that really resonated with me within the... That's right. I don't know, all things faith, which I'm sure we'll get into at some point. And so I I think I reached out to you, but yeah, Yeah. definitely, definitely share a lot of similar thoughts, I think. So, yes, I've definitely sensed a kindred spirit in you for sure. And today I didn't know that we were doing a podcast interview. So I just like to share these stories because it's like so real life. I was sitting actually in the parking lot of Starbucks (laughs) Perfect. And I got a message from Morgan, like, Hey, where's the link for the zoom? I'm like, Oh no, are we supposed to have a episode and something glitched with my Calendly and all that to say, I ran home because I wanted to make this happen. And she's been gracious enough to be like, yeah, let's do it a few minutes late. And I'm excited because usually when things are random like that, something beautiful comes out of it. So I am looking forward to this conversation and Morgan for all of us, because I don't know you that well at this point either. And I'm excited to get to know you better, but can you just tell us like a little bit about who you are, where you are and what you're about? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's so funny. I had to write out my bio for a podcast last week and just like, and you'll know this, the more you get into this conversation, those of you who are listening, I have partially been forced, partially, it's just who I am. I, I'm, I have to be honest and real and authentic. And so I'll say that, like, I can give you some very resume, like, uh, things that I do right now. My personal life is very messy at this moment. And so, the bio is tricky at this moment. Yeah. And so I will say that, uh, well, I'll just say it. I, so I'm married to Hugh. Um, we are actually currently separated right now. So we are not living together, which is just a part of where we're at in the story. Um, and we have three children. We have James who lives on this side of heaven. He is 11. We adopted him at seven and a half. James has mild cerebral palsy. He's from China. And he, again, has been home for about four years. We also have our daughters, Bailey Grace and Allie. Bailey Grace died at six in July 13th of 2019. And Allie died at seven and a half, December 16th of 2020. And so the girls were twins. They had a rare non-hereditary disease called HECW2. They are the only set of twins known in the world to have this disease. And essentially, uh, that story is a whole episode in itself uh, that I'm going to open book with, but it's just too many details to name. But the summary of it is that they got diagnosed at two and a half. Um, mm-hmm. And then we recognize their variant as progressive over time. And so of course, Bailey Grace, the way that their brain intestine connection works, their intestines just ultimately shut down wow. um, food, food and their brain did not, were not compatible. And so Bailey Grace uh, died 17 months before Allie died and Allie's journey we sort of knew was coming right and so it's kind of a slow nightmare to death's door as we sort of just watched her fade away because once we had gone through it once we kind of knew what we knew and so there were gifts there and that we allowed Bailey Grace to be a good teacher and how to keep Allie most comfortable but there were also just a lot of there's just a lot of trauma. There's a lot of trauma there and um, a lot to unpack. And so again, that happened December 16th of 2020. And since then, um, I am a writer. I had two books out prior to the girls passing away. Now I have a third book out um, that's more of like a modern day Psalms. And my journey career-wise has sort of stayed the same and also shifted. So I still write and I still speak. And I also am a NASM certified personal trainer and I have a business with my business partner, Wynn. We have a business called Women Fitness. It is online fitness for people that we work with all over the world and we do more holistic health. So we really try to combine physical and mental health. I also am a master's in social work. And so I try to 
combine that aspect of things as we help people sort of individually get to the healthiest versions of themselves when it comes to movement and nutrition um, and really their mental health too, because it's all connected. So uh, that is, that's kind of a bio for you. Uh, there's a lot more in there, but that gives you sort of a synopsis, I guess, of, of kind of who I am. Yeah. I mean, every single piece of that is like a large story in and of itself, right? It is. <laughs> That's why it's hard. It's like, I feel like it's, uh, I don't want to say insulting to God, but a little bit, if I don't include all those different aspects, because they are, I mean, they're all very large pieces of, mm -hmm. of who I believe I was created to be. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're also very nuanced, right? I mean, they're, they're very, everything in my life right now is shifting and changing and breaking and healing. And it's all just one big pile, mm. um, of really pretty pieces, but just messy pieces too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think really, honestly, if we all take a look at our lives, we can relate to that in some way, shape or form. Absolutely. Obviously your story has had some extreme things happen that most of us don't understand. We probably will never face, but at the same time, just this idea that suffering comes into our lives unexpectedly. And there are so many things that change in us and about our lives as we move along. I actually just recorded a podcast episode where I was talking about how my dreams have changed completely mm. from when I was younger to now, which I'm sure you can relate to just because life happens. But as life happens, you also become this person right. <laughs> that you are now, which you probably never would have imagined before. But I would, I would love to just hear a little bit like, who was that Morgan before you had children? Did you, did you have this dream of being a mom? Was that like always a thing on your heart or how did that process happen? I love this because I was telling someone the other day at the risk of sounding really trendy. I relate more to child Morgan now mm. than I ever have. And I think that's a good sign. Um, yeah. I, I really like the whole inner child thing. Like I really, I really relate to like child Morgan. I feel like I'm sort of coming back into mm. that. And yeah. So, I mean, Morgan before the girls was free spirit. I kind of beat to my own drum my whole life. And that's, that's a huge part of my faith journey in general is that yeah. I felt very connected to God from a young age, just very organically, authentically. Um, but also in turn, didn't really feel like I fit in the small town, Southern evangelical box mm -hmm. of Christianity that was sort of the brand that was around me. And so I wrestled a lot with just like wanting to make my dad, aka God proud at the risk of sounding cringy. I know some people like some, there's some <laughs> Christian phrases, like when people say like daddy God, that I'm like, Oh, like, no, <laughs> you know, so I feel like that was like, that was one of those moments for some people. But for me, it really was, it was like, man, I want to make just it, organically who I am wants to make my creator proud. Mm. And also I'm a real, I'm really afraid that some pieces of who I am don't make him proud mm. and are more my, you know, quotation flesh. And so what do I do? Do I hide those pieces? Do I just try to pray them away? Do I push them away? Um, and in this season, what I think I'm finding is that I'm owning those pieces and mm. The result of that has been a love and acceptance and security in who I am and, and in who God says I am, like I've never had before. Um, but it's brave work. It, it's scary to say, hey, this is who I thought that I was supposed to be. And consciously and subconsciously, as someone who says that I'm a really authentic person, and I think I was, I think I was, I think I was being as true to myself as I knew how to be, For sure. um, but, but just, you know, woundings from myself and other people and, and just life kind of had me in a place where I really felt like people liked the churchy version of me more. Like they liked the Morgan that stood on the stage, 
in the conservative outfits and used all the right scriptures and talked to people about God's goodness and really hard things. The Morgan that drove the minivan and pulled the wheelchairs out of said minivan and, you know, I was meek and mild and just a helper. And, and, and those things in, in a season were roles that I played, but ultimately are not really personality wise who I am. I'm, I'm pretty domineering and, and have an opinion on everything and blunt and loud and always have something to say and want to share and uh, like wearing crop tops working out. Like there's just things that I felt like Morgan couldn't be that, that once Allie died, I realized very quickly that I could not, and I don't know, you can bleep me if you need to, like, I couldn't bullshit with God anymore. Like literally, if we were going to have a real relationship moving forward, I had to show up as my full self with my full story and trust that that was okay. And I've been doing that since December 17th of 2020. And the Morgan before the girls, ironically, is now the Morgan that I'm seeing, if that makes Mm -hmm. sense. Like, but she's been hidden for a while. And so I'm just discovering even, I'm, I'm learning how to own who I am. I'm learning you know, again, I'm a free spirit. I like the deep, serious things of the world, but I also am pretty dang goofy and like to have fun and like really good food and enjoy a glass of red wine. And, you know, fitness is very important to me. And there are just things that I used to consider of this world, if mm-hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. That now I'm just considering like being present and fully alive to where God has me. Hopefully that makes some some sort of sense. No, I'm like smiling inside and out because that just made me so happy. (laughs) Mm. Um, I love, like, even you just used the phrase fully alive. That's like my favorite phrase. My, for the longest time, my favorite quote has been the glory of God is man fully alive by St. Arrhenius. And even when I first learned that quote, I didn't really understand what it meant, but I, I continue to see people like you who around me are like just unfolding. It's like, I've had enough of fake, like life is real. Let's be real. And let's allow God to show himself fully through who he's created us to be. So I just think that's beautiful. Um, and you obviously went through a lot of pain to get to this point, the before and the after, Um, So I would love for you to just tell us like about the girls and who they were and how they changed your life and impacted this whole journey. Cause I'm sure like that in between time with them here, there were a lot of different roles that you played. Like you even mentioned, like getting the wheelchairs out of the minivan. That's not a role that many of us listeners are going to be playing in our lives, but there was a piece of you that was like, this is, this is who I am. And yeah. Yeah. Just tell us more about that. Yeah. I mean, I was in my lane when I was the mother of the girls and the irony, not so irony of that was that it was a role, obviously I I never knew existed and I, and I never would have chosen, but once I did it and was in it, I felt very myself in that, in that role. It's Mm. so again, the girls, uh, healthy pregnancy, healthy birth. I always tell people, I mean, I, for kids that had a brain intestine issue, I breastfed twins for seven months. So like there was no inclination really of much going on until the girls were about six months old and they weren't hitting developmental milestones. And so we decided that we just kind of wait and see, um, but start early intervention, et cetera. And then about nine ish months, it really shifted to where, okay, now they're not meeting any milestones really at all. Mm -hmm. Something's going on. So we went to the neurologist then and, um, essentially started the testing process for the hundreds of bajillions of genetic diseases that are out there. And I think a vulnerable thing about that, and, you know, I would imagine at some point, someone who has a child, with a hereditary 
genetic disease will listen to this. And so I, I really want to be sensitive and make this clear that the vulnerable part of the genetic process is that a lot of diseases are hereditary. Mm-hmm. And a lot of us are carrying around these mutations and diseases that we do pass on to our children that we have no control over, um, mm-hmm. that are not our fault. And so when I say it's non-hereditary, I guess I want to put my pride down in being honest and saying that feels good to say, mm-hmm. um, feels good to say we didn't carry that. That wasn't from us. You know, that was, but the reality is if you're listening to this and your child has a hereditary disease, that's not on you either. Yeah. yeah. So I just, I, 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 sometimes I think I fail to acknowledge that. And I just want to recognize my own pride and, and, and immaturity really. And having to always say it was non-hereditary. Um, but the vulnerable part of that process is that you are, they're testing you and your spouse, um, and other kids, if you have them for all these different diseases that you really never knew existed. Um, and it's sort of stripping you of, I mean, I think it has the potential to make you really cynical of the world because you recognize like, gosh, there are just so many people walking around with perfectly normal, whatever that means, healthy kids that have absolutely no idea of all that could have gone quote wrong in their pregnancy. And then they're just be bopping around living their lives. Meanwhile, we're getting stuck every few days, you know, checking off boxes of things that it isn't trying to figure out what it is. And so Wow. Um, we finally got diagnosed by the National Institute of Health. They were studying rats in Sweden and they recognized a mutation that hadn't been known as a disease that came up on our girls and five other kids. So wow. they did a case study and it was the very first case study they'd ever done and sort of determined that HEC W2 was the cause of the girl's disability. And so that was when the girls were about two and a half. And we obviously still didn't know a ton. And it was seven kids. We didn't really know a trajectory Mm -hmm. about their lives. At that point, we had just decided to get feeding tubes. We had just determined we were probably going to have wheelchairs. So we were realizing that their disability was significant, but we didn't really know what that was going to mean for their lives. Mm -hmm. And a lot of our days prior to the girls turning six, that's really when things shifted for Bailey Grace. And that's really when her brain started shutting down and things just, she just wasn't herself anymore. But there were years of the girls' lives where yes, they had feeding tubes and trouble with digestion and there'd be a lot of vomit and there were some seizures from time to time, but they were ultimately present and engaged and happy. And even though they weren't not, or they weren't verbal, um, they would, you know, we can make eye contact when we walked in the room and they would smile at people they knew and they would give us hugs and Mm -hmm. high fives and babble. And they just loved the simple things of life. They loved just being around the people that they loved and their personalities were very different. Bailey Grace was more quiet, soft-spoken. I always tell people she's more like my husband. Um, Didn't really require like being the center of attention in any room. She just wanted to be loved on and just, mm-hmm. you know, and, and just with, uh, and then Allie was sassy and opinionated and wanted to know what was going on in the room. And, you know, she would, we would, I'd pick them up from school and Allie would still have her bow and her shoes on and she would look all like prim and proper and Bailey Grace's ears all over her face. <laughs> She's got drool running down her mouth, no shoes. Like she was just like, not into, you know, the sass and the, and the, and the sweet, like Allie was, but, um, they were just great. And they taught us to enjoy, I mean, it sounds so cliche, but they really taught us to enjoy the simple things in life. They taught us to enjoy, um, just sitting in a hammock on a, a good weather day because they couldn't, their body didn't regulate temperature well. So if it was really hot, like couldn't be outside long it was a good temperature day. We'd sit in a hammock and they would just babble, sing is what we called it to themselves. And that's all we did. And that's all we had to do. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a schedule. We didn't have an agenda. We didn't have to be at t-ball games or this event. And it was just a very simple way of living. And our weekends were spent prior to adopting James, just the four of us doing that, going on walks, maybe like getting wild and like taking them to dinner with their feeding tubes and, you know, sitting, you know, if we could find a table where the four of us would fit, like 
it was just such a simple life. And we had had one focus and that was keeping them alive. Mm -hmm. That was literally like, that was my life's focus for almost eight years was keeping them alive. They had their seizure activity was present during the day, but it was very frequent at night. Mm -hmm. And so they weren't on the same schedule with seizures. So we didn't sleep. I mean, we would lay down and one would wake up having a seizure and they'd vomit. So go clean them up, calm them down, change the bed sheets, start the laundry, lay down about 30 minutes later, the other one might wake up like all night long, you know? And so I didn't leave survival mode and I was fine with it, but I didn't leave survival mode for years and I didn't sleep for years and I didn't think about exercising for years or fueling my body well, or what my face looked like. I mean, I laugh. I'm like, I feel like I got younger when the girls died because Mm -hmm. I like slept, you know, I slept and I ate and I did some things, but again, wouldn't trade it for the world. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't trade it for the world. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. And the girls are so beautiful. Like I love, I I'm so grateful that you took so many pictures and videos of them because they're just magical. They're magical girls. So beautiful. Like I, I saw the video. It's going to make me cry, but I saw the video. Um, I don't remember which girl it was, but you were driving in the car and the wind was just like blowing in your face. Oh my gosh. The sweetness. Well, they were so so beautiful and people and anyone listening to this that knew them is nodding their head. They were addictive to be around. They were addictive to be around. We, I would have friends have a hard day and call and just say, Hey, can I just come and snuggle with the girls? Like, because being around them was just sacred and you knew it. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that was one of the more remarkable parts about the gift of being their mom was that I will never, and I mean, this is like a side note too, but I think one of the reasons why, even though I do have questions and doubts and I certainly don't wrap it all up in a bow and there's things that I'm very pissed with God about with this, with the story. So like in that being said, I think one of the things that keeps me grounded in God's goodness is the reality that I got to be their mom. Like Mm -hmm. I don't deserve the gift of being Allie and Bailey Grace's mom. I don't Mm -hmm. deserve to help like shoulder and advocate for them and share their story and have the impact on people that their lives have. That was undeserved. And I get to do that. And so I I'm just that that's a gift that I will never, ever understand why, you know, I got, I got that gift, but I, but I did. And I'm so grateful for it. Yeah, that's beautiful. It really is beautiful. And their lives continue to impact people. And I just love that. And I love that you just were able to enjoy like that simple season with them. It's really beautiful. I think a lot of us can get takeaways from that. Like even with me, I'm like, I don't want to get too busy with Mm -hmm. the kids because they're just children for a while and then it's over. Right. You know, so it makes me too just want to soak in all of the little sweet, simple moments of like my daughter likes to play what's your high and low of the day, just sitting around the table. And what's your high and low of the day? You know, it's so simple, but those are the best moments. Um just to soak those in. Yeah. Yeah. When Allie, when we knew that Allie was going to be actively dying soon. It was right around Christmas time. And we knew she probably wasn't going to make it to Christmas. And she died. She last, she honestly lasted longer than we thought. She didn't die till the 16th of December. But starting November, we put up Christmas lights and then our neighbors put up Christmas lights. And then Aww. the community heard about it and put up Christmas lights. And then honestly, like not to exaggerate, the world heard about it. And people just started putting up Christmas lights and we were hearing from Corey Asbury, Kristen Bell, like all these random people. And it felt like a movie. And also in the midst of that, I mean, and this is kind of what we were talking about before we started, but, you know, I had 
liked the idea of being able to share our story and make an impact in my books to be known. And, uh, but Allie's dying in the midst of that. And so we got a call from like the ABC, like not local ABC, but like the ABC. And they wanted to do a special on our family and come in. And, and we just didn't know how many more days we had left with her. And so I didn't even ask, I probably should have asked, other people, but should have asked you, but I didn't ask anybody else. I literally just on the phone just said, Hey, I don't think so. And it was, I mean, again, as cliche as it sounds, it really was a moment where I was like, this is what matters. Mm -hmm. Like people, the people in front of your face, Mm -hmm. those are the people that matter. Like Mm -hmm. the, this other stuff that seems flashy and glamorous and that yeah, it can be exciting for a minute when you have your child dying in front of you. That really doesn't matter. Like you just want to spend time with your kid. And Mm -hmm. the beautiful part of all that was, you know, people got to tell Allie bye. We didn't, some people got to tell Bailey Grace bye. But one of the things that I always say, Bailey Grace was the best teacher for her sister because she taught us how to love Allie well during that time. And, uh, I was just very determined to let the people who had loved Allie well and who had loved her so much have a time where they told her by and, mm. and where they told, oh, I'm going to cry now, but where they told her what she meant to them. Wow. And having the privilege as a mom of watching, you know, it wasn't, we didn't let everybody in, but watching 20 or 30 people come to your house and sit with your seven year old. And tell her what an impact she had made on their life. Like, wow, that's priceless. Wow. And I I just, they would leave. And every time I would look at her and I would just say, I am so proud of who you are. Mm. Like she just, they just impacted so many people just by being who they were. Mm. And that's also something I hope that the people listening can hear is that it doesn't take much to impact somebody, but what it does take is being yourself. And that, that's the brave, that's the brave work that a lot of us push back on so often, um, in a world that, that sort of has expectations or plans maybe on who they think we are, but the gift of offering ourselves is, is why my girls made such an impact because they just were who they were. They just were who they were and they allowed the person in front of them to be exactly who they were too. And it, it changed the world. It changed the people in front of them. Wow. Yeah. That'll teach man. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's pretty extraordinary. And it totally goes back to what you're saying about how you're seeing like the young you come back now, which really, I, I think when we tap into like that inner child, like you're talking about, um, we become just like you said, more authentically us. Yeah. And when we start to be able to strip away that performance, like it's so healing and liberating, (laughs) but we really struggle to do that. Mm -hmm. Don't we? Yes. And I think, I think particularly, and I guess I feel this way because it, it's my background, but I think that, you know, as a Christian, I'm not sure where performance like, it's just hysterical to me that that, because it's the exact opposite of the gospel. Right. And it's like <laughs> the thing that we, we can't stop trying to do is perform when God himself is like, no, like it's, it's not about your performance. And we're like, cool, cool. We're going to still try to perform. Yeah. Uh, and that just shows just how imperfectly human we are, you know, human we are and beautifully mm-hmm. human we are too. But I, I feel this sense of, I mean, even when it comes to theology and questions, I used to have conversations with people and if they had differing opinions than me, felt like it was really my role Mm. to sort of give them my knowledge and wisdom and lead them in the right direction. And now I'm just enjoying the mystery of the more capital M that God is like, I don't know where you're supposed to be in your journey. I have absolutely no idea how God wants to draw you closer to himself. I don't know 
you know, if the theology that I hold true to my heart and which I, I do think it's important, like you need to know what you believe personally, yeah. like you, you need to explore that and wrestle with that and, and think through that. That's important. But, and then after you've done that, it's like, it's not your, it's not my job to sort of usher you into my beliefs. Like those are, those are true to me right now. I, I don't know. I've just, I guess I've just shifted. It's, it's so much more of a comfortable space to just enjoy other people yeah. instead of making other people projects. Totally. And it also makes me feel like less of a project to God when I live that way. Absolutely. And that's more restful too. So I think that's being more like a child, you know, I mean, I think children don't, you know, they're not children who live freely, at least are not concerned about anything that they say, they just live life and say it and and find security there. And so Mm -hmm. as we grow up, whatever that means, I I still don't feel like a grown up. I'm like, (laughs) at what point, at what point do we feel like grown ups? You know, I don't know. <laughs> I think my it's a grandmother. Myth. My grandmother at ninety four still said she didn't feel like a grown up, and that sort of Aww. settled it to me. I was like, okay, well, <laughs> I'm just gonna be a kid. <laughs> but it, but it is funny. I mean, this is such a side note, but like with our own kids, I think it's funny because you know, like a storm comes at night, and we like put on this big like everything's gonna be fine. But then that little kid inside of us is like. I mean, but is it, <laughs> you know, like, like but yeah. I'll tell you, I think everything's going to be fine. And it's just, mm-hmm. I don't know. It's funny, but no, I do think that like, yeah, I just, I've just found a lot of rest in the mystery of who God is and who I am and what that's going to look like moving forward and kind of settling in to just sort of be along for the ride instead of trying, trying to drive the car in the direction I thought it was going to go. Yeah. It's definitely not going that direction. You know, <laughs> we but like it has derailed off that path a while ago. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. I can relate to that hundred percent. And you mentioned earlier, like there are areas where you've been pissed at God. Yeah. Like, and I, I love the realness of that because I know I have been there and I, sometimes I even, I think about your story. Cause I'm like, I'm so mad about this situation right now. And it's like nothing <laughs> compared to which, you know, we don't want to compare, but still, right. I hear you there. I, it's very encouraging to see you still loving Jesus, even though I'm sure there are moments where you're still angry. There are moments when you have been angry, but for anyone listening who has been to that place of despair or like what in the world, you're not acting like I thought you would act. This isn't going at all. Like I'd expect according to your promises, what the heck is happening? Like what has that process looked like for you to continue moving forward in faith? Yeah. I mean, I feel like I tell this story. I feel like I tell this story too much and so it's like, I always hesitate to tell it again, because I'm like, I don't want people to be like, I literally hear her tell the story every time, but it's important. So I'm going to tell it again, um, because it was pivotal for me. So a few days before Allie died, she had already been without fluids for like, I don't know, 12 days or something crazy like that. Wow. And one of the only things I'd asked from God in the whole thing, which felt very like faithful of me in my mind. It's like, this is all I'm asking of him. Like that feels was that the death process would be easier than it had been with Bailey Grace. Because when Mm -hmm. Bailey Grace died, um, it, we couldn't get her pain under control. It was nine days, which felt like a really long time. Like it, and I was just like, please let it be shorter. Well, it couldn't have been anything. It couldn't have been anything more than the opposite of that. Like it was just dragging out. She was a skeleton. It was awful. It was awful. And she hadn't been in pain for a couple of days, which that was the thing I was kind of holding on to is like, but she hasn't been in pain. That's good. And we were laying next to her. I mean, you don't really sleep when your kid's dying. I don't, I mean, you luckily they're just listening to your kid breathe and mm-hmm. we're laying there next to her. And suddenly she wakes up and there is no way to describe it unless you've been around a dying child, which not many, you know, not many people have, but a dying child, when you recognize that they're in pain, 
And when it's your child and you can't do anything about it, like shoot me with a gun. Like, like, I mean, and I don't mean that lightly. Like I literally yeah. mean like there is nothing worse that I can possibly imagine. And so we call our hospice nurse and we're trying to figure out like, what do we do? She's in pain. And I'm, I am so angry on the phone. She's our hospice nurse is now like a dear friend of mine. She was with us when both girls died and I just love her so much. And she was with us that entire process, but I'm just angry. And so I'm just like yelling at her, like, why is this happening? Like, what do we give her? Like, how, why is she not knocked out right now? Why is she not brain dead right now? Like what, what's happening? Mm -hmm. And Hugh is, my husband is holding Allie and he's just like singing under his breath some song that says God is good. And I just feel my blood pressure rising, like, shut up. Like yeah. we are sitting here defending this being that has literally killed both of our kids in a torturous way. And now is doing this. Like, I don't care if you call it light and momentary or a mystery I can't understand this is crazy. Like this is batshit crazy. And mm -hmm. so I looked at him and just said, stop singing that. You know, it was kind of like, and he could see like, she's unraveling, you know, it's like, and so we finally get Allie's pain under control and we're just sitting there. And suddenly for really the first time in my life, I feel my faith just slipping. Like, mm -hmm if it's happened to you, get that, like, I start to think, I don't know if I believe this anymore. I really don't. I don't know if I can ever believe this to be true after I've seen what I've seen. Like, I don't know. And so I just looked at Hugh and I said, I think God is real. And I think he's a psychic. And I said it and I kind of looked up, like kind of embarrassed, but also kind of like, yeah, what are you gonna do? Strike me with lightning? Sounds good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like I don't, you know, like what you got for me? And it freaked me out a lot. Like I'm, I'm an engineer in four, so I'm kind of dramatic. And me too, I, girl. Oh, so there you go. <laughs> well, I'd already pictured like during that whole time. Like when I tell the story to a couple of my friends that are not this way, they're like, in that moment you were doing this. I'm like, oh yeah, my brain has always got a story. And like in that moment, I'm literally like thinking like I probably won't speak at her funeral. Like I thought. I'm probably not going to ever speak as a Christian speaker again in my life. Like I'm like planning my life ahead, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it scared me. And so I took my Bible, opened it to Lamentations 3, which is just basically like, a you know, a chat, Lamentations 3 is basically a chapter saying like, God has beat me to the dust. Um, everybody loves to talk about the one verse that says his mercy, his mercies are new every morning. But the reality is the rest of it is like, God has put me in the gravel. He mm -hmm. hates me. He's, and so I just opened that up. Cause I was like, I just want you to know, like, this is how I feel. I'm not going to even read it, but like, this is what I'm going to say to you right now. I opened it up and I laid it by my head in my bed and just laid there because I just felt scared. And I texted, I had a, a group text chain with some of my closest friends friends that I've just been keeping updated and I texted and said in a very dark place that's all mm. it said it's just like I'm in a very dark place and anyway slept for a few hours and Allie lived through the night and actually four days later uh but woke up the next morning and all I wanted to do was sit with God wow. and like I knew that that was not me Mm -hmm. There was nothing in me that had made that choice. And I just felt God whisper to my heart in a firm, like, and you know, I've done the whole, like, God is hot post. Cause like, I just, it just resonates with me because I'm like, God does some things that are really assertively hot and <laughs> he just does. And I think that's okay. He made hotness, like whatever. <laughs> and it was kind of, it was just like a very assertive, but kind voice that I just am not, I didn't hear an audible voice, but just in my heart that said, my hold's on you, your hold's not on me. Mm. Like, it's like, almost like, let's get this straight, you know? Yeah. And so from that point on, this is how I have lived in, that's just how I've lived. Like his hold is on me. My hold's not on him. 
I'm living in the freedom that comes from just acknowledging that on a daily basis and letting him be God. Yeah. And it looks different all the time. And I outwardly am more of a messy person, I would say at this point, whatever that means, but I'm more myself Mm -hmm. and I'm starting to believe that that's not me quote, giving into my flesh or whatever. I I think I'm just being me. Um, and I'm a softer person. I'm a more compassionate person. I'm a less judgmental person. I'm a more free person. Like I'm seeing these fruits that I've longed for just simply by like resting in that love Mm -hmm. and, and, and letting myself be where I'm at and genuinely trusting God to be God, genuinely trusting that if it really is true that he created me and that he loves me so much and that he's in control. And he's like, if that's really true, after watching my own kids die, if there was anything I could have done, anything, if, if God said, all right, you're going to have to go to the nearby Walmart and like shoot up the whole Walmart, but like, we're going to let your kids live. I'd be like, all right, where's the gun? You know, I mean, literally like if there was anything I could have done, I would have done it. And so when I think about that in the context of God and me, he's going to keep me safe, Mm. whatever that looks like. And it may not look safe on this side, but like me, my soul, who I am, like there's no, there's nothing to be scared of here. And yeah, I mean, that's how I've done it. I've just lived in, in the freedom that is love. I've just lived in the freedom that's love. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. So good. And I think like, that's what I want from life too. I I'm obsessed with the book of Galatians. I don't know if you've spent a lot of time there, but it's like the freedom book (laughs) where it's all like, even Paul says something. And I think chapter three is like, you foolish Galatians who has bewitched you when they're trying to basically prove their holiness. Mm -hmm. And he's like, Jesus already did this. Like, don't rebuild what he already tore down. And I'm like, that's what life needs to be about. Like, like you said, when you, when you said, um, he's holding on to you and you don't have to, you don't have to hold to him because he's holding you. I just had the picture of like the little baby carriers (laughs) where the kids are just like Mm. their hands and legs are like free, but they're connected to their parent. And I'm like that, that's, that's how I want to live with God, like just alive yeah. and free like that. I think that's just beautiful. So thank you for sharing this story. Oh um, even, yeah. even if you felt like you've shared it a lot, I, it was very impactful and I know a lot of people will be hearing it for the first time. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, I shared a story just last week that was kind of similar where I screamed at the sky, Jesus is a liar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was a turning point for me, for sure. Exactly. (laughs) I mean, you know, like sometimes when we put the layers out, like the real stuff comes out and I think God's like, okay, now, Mm -hmm. now we're here. Now we got something. Okay. We're being real now. (laughs) There's authenticity. There she is. (laughs) (laughs) There she is. I know who she was, but there she is. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Well, my friend, I could talk to you for hours but I don't want to spend any more of your time here today. You've spent such a wonderful, precious time with me. Um, Thank you so much for your vulnerability and for sharing and for letting us hear about the girls next time. I'd love to hear more about James and your adoption and all of that too, because that's a whole other story as well. I have a few lives within one life. <laughs> you totally and, and do. And more to come, honestly. Yes, Who definitely. Knows what the next, what the next one's going to bring. Definitely. Yeah. Um, but I feel encouraged and I'm thankful to know you. I would love for people to be able to connect with you. I'll put stuff in the show notes, but if you just yeah. want to share, like what's the best way to connect with you? Yeah. So Seeds and Leaven, Seeds and Leaven is my Instagram. That's really the best way to connect in general. Winmo Fitness is my business account. And, you know, I always tell people if anything that I said resonated with you when it comes to just the realm of holistic health, if you need somebody to walk alongside you with that, 
would love for you to DM me there too. Um, so those are kind of the best two outlets to connect. Awesome. Love it. Well, thank you, friend. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. We'll chat soon. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. Bye.